All right. So last time uh, we talked about a number of things. Um, I think we talked about uh, overall first order reactions, uh, second order and zero order uh, reactions. Remember that each of these have its, has its own uh, sort of integrated uh, rate laws uh, that does concentration versus time. Uh, again, uh, kind of first order natural log of A equals natural log of A naught uh, minus KT uh, second one over A equals one over A naught uh, plus KT. And zero uh, concentration of A equals A naught uh, minus KT. Uh, they also have specific sort of graphs to go with it. So again, natural log of A uh, versus time should give you a straight line where the slope equals negative the rate constant for first order. Um, for uh, second order here, uh, the graph is a little different. It's one over A. And time gives you a positive sloping line uh, where the slope is equal to K. And then obviously our zero order uh, will give us our concentration versus time. Also giving us a negatively sloping line. It gives us an, a negative rate constant. Uh, they also obviously have some half-life equations as we also talked about um, that go with them. And they're different, obviously, depending on which one that we deal with. We then got into, towards the end there, uh, a conversation about sort of temperature and the effect on the rate constant. And as we talked about, essentially, um, as you increase the temperature, you're adding more energy. And what that essentially will give you is a greater proportion of molecules, right, that have sufficient energy uh, to overtake the hill, if you will. And remember that hill of energy that we talked about is the activation energy, right? And that's the hill that the reactant's got to climb, basically, to get to the other side. At the top of the hill is our transition state. And again, that is the part where we have that activated complex or transition state complex, uh, which is essentially uh, a guy that has partially made bonds, partially broken bonds as it's sort of coming off to the other side. This obviously is what type of uh, graph? Exothermic, endothermic? Yeah, this is exothermic. Our reactants are higher in energy than our products, so energy going to be given off as a result of that. Um, <clears throat> we also talked about another way, obviously, you can speed up a reaction is to use a catalyst. Uh, and again, a catalyst finds an alternative pathway for a reaction to take place. And ultimately, what it does is it lowers that activation energy or that hill that the reactants has to climb to get to the other side. That means that uh, in most cases, you'll have a lot more... <clears throat> reactants with a sufficient amount of energy to really get to the other side. And that usually sort of correlates to a much faster rate. Uh, again, a catalyst uh, is not really a, a reactant or a product. It does get used up in the reaction. It is typically there just to sort of facilitate the reaction, sort of happening more efficiently, as we talked about. And the end result of that in terms of energy is it will kind of lower that energy barrier for uh, the reactants to get to their side and thus increasing it. The relationship between sort of uh, temperature and the rate constant is the Uranus equation. And there's two versions of it that we looked at. Uh, there is the uh, natural log of K is equal to minus E of A over R one over T uh, plus R natural log of A in this case. And this is our Y is equal to MX plus B. Uh, very similar to, I think we did this example at the end last time. And again, uh, when we have some values given to us, and we do need to make this plot, uh, we do need to take the natural log of all the rate constants, and we do need to make sure our temperatures in Kelvin and then take one over the temperatures, typically what you plot. And as we see here, we plot the natural log of K versus one over the temperature. That should usually give you a negative sloping line uh, where the slope of that line is equal to minus E of A over R, R being the gas constant. And again, in this case, it is the one that deals with energy, not the one that we use for the ideal gas law. So the other thing that we talked about again is that you'll end up with joules if you obviously solve using this. The sloping line here is negative, which means our slope's gonna be negative. 
and there is this negative right and that should turn our activation energy into a positive number as we talked about as it should be a positive number in all cases um so that's how we get to our positive number again activation energy when you do sort of report the answer uh, is typically usually given in kilojoules is the very common uh, unit that it's either given to you in or how you usually report it uh, if it doesn't really specify, you can give it in any unit you want, but uh, it's really important, maybe more so when you go into the other version of the Uranus equation, which is sometimes referred to as the two-point version of the equation. And really what that means is that line that we just saw, say in that graph, you would actually take two points off of that line, and that's technically what we would be putting into this equation in this case. So that's the natural log of K2 over K1. And again, uh, those are two rate constants at different temperatures uh, that correlate to T1 and T2. So as we might have talked about at the very end last time, it really doesn't matter when you kind of go through a problem, which one you call kind of K1 or K2, as long as you keep K1 and the temperature that goes with it together and the other K and the temperature that goes with it together. Now that gives you uh, E of A over R, uh, one over T1 minus one over T2. So couple of things that we talked about, I think, at the end there. We do actually want to divide this first and then take the natural log. So not natural log of each and then divide. Um, Unit-wise, once again, as I just mentioned, this is typically in kilojoules. This is always going to be in joules. So you got that difference in units, which is a common thing that people mess up on. They kind of do – they forget to do one conversion. So – um, as I may mentioned last time, I personally will convert probably the kilojoules to joules and then kind of convert it back at the end. But again, it could go either way. And the other important thing, obviously, is these guys need to be in Kelvin as well. So if you have two rate constants at two different temperatures, you can calculate the activation energy. If you know the activation energy and maybe one rate constant and a couple of temperatures, you can figure out what the new rate constant would be at a different temperature and so forth. Um, so that's more of a mathematical solving of uh, sort of activation energy and temperature. Any questions on any of that stuff there? We sort of talked about last time. All right, so I think we laid it up here. Oh, by the way, we also talked about, I think, uh, just to once again restate it, uh, there are like three different versions of this equation here. So you may see it written differently. Uh, for example, in the lab, I think in the lab manual, when we get to that um, experiment, um, they write it slightly different. It just depends whether or not they sort of distribute out the minus there in the parentheses to the outside. And sometimes you also see it where they will combo the uh, denominator inside the parentheses as well. So there actually are a few different versions of this equation. Personally, I will always use this one, but don't be surprised if you look in the lab manual, it's like, looks a little different the equation and again it was how they sort of distributed out some things and as you distribute out those things the t1 t2 will change you know which one comes first and stuff like that so my advice is maybe just stick with this one and you can use it anytime you need to kind of use that equation um but just be aware you might see some different versions of it as you go through it all right so why don't we try this one reaction has a rate constant of 2.57 as Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so we do have a rate constant here uh, that is 2.57. Uh, we have a temperature that goes with it, which is 701. Uh, we have another rate constant given to us uh, that is 567. And there temperature that goes with it. So this is what I was uh, sort of talking about a second ago. Um, it doesn't really matter which ones you call one or two, as long as you keep the K and the T that go together together and they call them the same number. Um, most people will probably just go exactly how it's written in the problem. So most people will probably call this guy one, which means that's temperature one, and call this guy two, which means this one has to be temperature two in that case. But again, it really doesn't matter as long as you keep those temperatures and stuff with the proper rate constant. Uh, in this case, we're looking for E of A, so we have the natural log of uh, K2 over K1 equals our E of A over R, our 1 over our T1 minus 1 over T2. Uh, so we've got everything in here to plug in, I think. So natural log of our K2 will go 567, uh, 2.57 equals E of A, which is what we're solving for. 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. That's a constant. Um, 
And again, here, 1 over 701 Kelvin minus 1 over uh, 895 Kelvin in this case. All right, so I'm going to kind of clean up the left-hand side here. So once again, I'm going to divide first, 567 divided by 257, 2.57. I'm going to take the natural log of it. And it looks like we'll get something like uh, 5.396453 equals E of A over 8.314. I'm going to also clean up uh, what we got going on in here. So I'm going to take uh, 1 divided by 701 and going to subtract it from 1 divided by 895, it looks like. And that's going to give me uh, 0 0.00030921.5. I need to uh, multiply the 8.314 to the other side, and then I need to divide that guy, right? So we're going to first multiply, then divide. Uh, so I'm going to take my <clears throat> 5.396 number. I'm going to multiply it by 8.314. I'm then going to divide it by my 0 0.0003 number there. And that's going to give me a E of A of like 15145090963. These are joules, by the way, coming from here is where our joules would come from. And uh, to get it to kilojoules, we'll divide by 1,000. And uh, we'll take us to about 145 kilojoules in this case, positive number um, <clears throat> for our activation energy. Any questions on that mathematically? There. I really didn't round up anything till kind of the end there. <clears throat> Any questions on that one? Yeah. And again, uh, it, it did actually ask for kilojoules per mole, so we do need to divide by the thousand there, and it, the moles will still be there as well. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, let's try another one then. Let's see. Oh, it is opposite the rate of reaction doubles every 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature. Calculate the activation energy in this case. Numbers in terms of rate constants, and they sort of randomly sort of chose kind of normal temperatures, a 10 degree change. So really depending on what temperatures you would choose in a problem like this, you might get a slightly different answer, but still in the same ballpark probably. But what we do know is uh, with that 10 degree temperature rise, uh, which in this case is like 27 degrees to 37 degrees, um, we will see that the rate will double. So although we don't know what uh, K1 or K2 is, we do know the K2, which is the second rate there, should be twice as fast as the first one. So uh, we could actually substitute that in for K2 in this case. And that would give us the natural log basically of 2K1 over K1 by substituting that into there. will give us E of A over our 8.314 Kelvin. And here, 1 over our 300 minus 1 over our 310 in this case. So uh, basically, uh, these guys cancel out because they are the same number. And that gives us really the natural log of two on the left-hand side, uh, which is going to give us our 0 0.693, basically. Uh, it's equal to our E of A over 8.314. And again, here, I'll clean up what's in the parentheses, 1 over 300 minus 1 divided by 310. Going to give us uh, 0 0.0001. I'll take all the numbers. Uh, Math-wise, we're going to multiply again and then divide. So multiply first and then divide would be the proper way of doing that. So basically, we got the natural log of 2 times 8.314 divided by our 0 0.00107 number there. Going to give us a activation energy of 53594. Again, these are joules. Dividing by a thousand, we'll move that decimal place over. So about fifty-three point six kilojoules per mole in this particular case. 
Any questions on that? <clears throat> Any questions on the uh, two-point version here? Now, in these couple of examples, we just solved for uh, activation energy, which clearly you could use this equation to do so. You could also have a problem where you might be solving for one of the temperatures. You could also obviously have a problem where you could be solving for one of the rate constants. So pretty much you could solve for every, anything that's in that equation except for R, which is a constant. So um, Make sure, obviously, you know how to properly rearrange it and solve for anything that might be asked for. Any questions on it? I say most of the time people uh, mess up on the math part of it. Yeah, they rearrange it and doing the proper sort of math operations in the correct order when they're solving for something like uh, K2 or T1 or something like that. Any questions on it? Yeah. I, I, I might, you want me to just do it on my calculator again? Oh, no, it's uh, that, that that comes from uh, here. That is what you get when you take care of that. Yeah, what was in the parentheses. <laughs> well, I think I punched it, right? I hope, <laughs> but maybe not. Other questions? No? Okay. So uh, the last thing we're going to talk about here in this chapter is uh, sort of mechanisms. And mechanisms are how reactions sort of take place or probable sort of uh, roads to how a reaction will take place. Uh, this is something that I think we might have talked about earlier, but again, just to reiterate that uh, you do need collisions to occur, obviously, for products to be made, uh, but a couple things has to happen, as we've been talking about. You do need them to sort of collide in the correct sort of orientation, like the active side of each. So in this case, if you hit it on the purple side there with the orange, you're good to go. Uh, but if you kind of hit it on the carbon side there, not much is going to happen. So just because things do collide with each other, it doesn't always guarantee that products would be made. Uh, the other thing that's really important as well, as we talked about, is that activation energy, right? Or the, the right amount of energy uh, with that collision to allow products to be formed. So you do need to kind of hit things in the right location. Do you need to have that right amount of energy to get up and over that hill uh, to get to the other side? So again, just collisions doesn't necessarily guarantee that products are formed. So when we have a reaction, we oftentimes will sometimes look at a what is referred to as a reaction mechanism. And as I mentioned before, a reaction mechanism is sort of an explanation as to, or a probable explanation as to how this reaction could take place. So what is meant by that is, as you should know, not all reactions is a one-step process where it maybe goes directly from reactions to products. It could actually occur in a couple steps or multiple steps. So for example, we could have A plus B goes to E plus, not E plus, I'll, I'll try my alpha a bit better there, C plus D, we'll do that. And then uh, C plus D maybe come together to make E plus F. So it is possible that reactions actually are made up of several individual reactions that when added together, uh, you end up with sort of the overall reaction that you're looking at. Now, when you have two reactions, as you should know from everybody's favorite thing, which is Hess's law, yes, yeah? so when you add a bunch of reactions together to get an overall reaction, yeah. Uh, when you add reactions together, anything that's on opposite sides of the arrow can cancel each other out or reduce down. You can think of the arrow almost like an equal sign, like you're subtracting it off the other side. So in this particular case, uh, C would cancel out, D would cancel out. And then anything that's on the left-hand side of the arrow should stay there. Anybody on the right-hand side of the arrow should stay there. And in this case, we get A plus B goes to E plus F. So what a reaction mechanism tries to show is what is sometimes referred to as these elementary steps. So these are all the steps that sort of lead you to the overall end reaction that you end up with. Uh, so, for example, here, if we look at uh, NO plus some oxygen to make some NO2, while this reaction is taking place, uh, N2O2 is detected. And clearly here, we do not see N2O2 appearing anywhere in the overall reaction. So what that means is that this reaction probably doesn't happen in a one-step situation. This is probably a result of multiple steps that are occurring. And in one of those steps, we should make some N2O2, right? Which is why it's detected during this reaction. And probably in another step, it should get used up because we no longer see it at the end of the reaction, right? 
So a lot of these sort of elementary sets will have things that are made early on in the reaction mechanism, but does get used up towards the end. Uh, so this is a plausible mechanism for how this reaction may take place. First, a couple of NOs go to N2O2, which would explain why we can detect it. But then those N2O2 basically gets used up in sort of the second stage or step of the reaction mechanism. And that is why it gets completely used up and canceled out and does not appear in the overall reaction when we're all said and done with it. And this is what is referred to as an intermediate. So an intermediate, as we will see, is something that is made early on in a reaction mechanism, but gets completely used up by the time it's over. Um, and that's the important part of an intermediate is the part where it gets used up before the reaction's over. That means that an intermediate should really never be seen in the overall reaction because it should definitely be kind of used up before it's all said and done. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Okay, there we go. So the so as I mentioned, those intermediates, bless you, are really important in the aspect that it has to be used up. So you cannot call something an intermediate if it's not completely gone by the time the reaction is over. And again, should not be in that overall reaction when we're done. Uh, now, when we look at these elementary steps, we can sort of classify these elementary steps in a couple of different ways. Uh, we could reclassify it as being unimolecular, which means that that elementary step basically just has one molecule that's reacting. Uh, it could be bimolecular, which means there's two molecules reacting. Uh, termolecular, which means there's three. And this goes back to some other things that we were talking about in this chapter that, you know, if you think about a lot of reactions that you've come across, you know, one, two, maybe three reactants. Again, you don't typically come across a lot of reactions where there's, you know, tons and tons of reactants sort of happening at once, right? Three is a lot of things reacting sort of at once. And uh, that's why we look at unimolecular, bimolecular, termolecular. As we were talking about with orders, that's also why, again, um, we don't really see super large orders typically for reactions because it would require a lot of reactants sort of happening at once. Now, in this, both of these elementary steps, both of these would be considered unimolecular, bimolecular, termolecular. They both would be bimolecular, right? They both got two things reacting in each of these elementary steps, so they would be bimolecular in this case. Now, when we look at rate laws and elementary steps, this is one of the places where we can actually write a rate law based on the elementary step. If you remember, we cannot write a rate law based on a reaction's coefficients, right? We got to kind of find those orders sort of experimentally and stuff like that. This is the one place where it's okay. And it's the only place where you could actually just look at the elementary step in this proposed mechanism and come up with a rate law based off of the coefficients that you see in it. So this is the only place really in kinetics where you can use the coefficients to write a, a rate law uh, to help you sort of prove whether or not this mechanism is good or not. So with that being said, what we see here is basically the coefficient is one, right? So we could write a rate law for this elementary step of the rates equal to K times A, and it basically is A to the one, right? So we don't really write the one in most cases. Uh, here we could have A and B, so the rate would be K to the A and B here. And again, both of those would be first order. This is basically the same thing as 2A, right? It goes to products, and that is where the two comes from, the coefficient. So any place outside of a mechanism, you should never use the coefficient for the orders, but when you're doing mechanisms and using elementary steps, it is okay to write a rate law uh, for those elementary steps. And the reason why is, uh, practical reason is, uh, we will need a rate law to help us sort of prove whether or not a mechanism is sort of a good mechanism or a bad mechanism. So when we look at a, a proposed mechanism, there is always a step that is considered the slow step in the mechanism. And that is what is referred to as the rate determining step. There's our turtle. And that is also sometimes referred to as the RDS, which is the rate determining step. 
And the rate determining step is really the slowest step in the mechanism. And it is really the one that basically determines how fast or how slow a reaction will take place. It's kind of like, again, when you go in the 10 items or less and the guy in front of you has got 400 items, right? You know, it's the only lane open, you know, you're not going to get through that lane, right? Until that slow person goes ahead of you. Uh, so it's the same idea in a mechanism. There's usually a step uh, that is the slow step or the rate determining step. And that is the one that determines, you know, how sort of fast or slow the reaction, reaction will take place. So when we sort of look at mechanism problems, there's a few different types of mechanism problems that uh, we will see. But ultimately, a lot of times what we're looking to try to determine is whether or not this mechanism is perhaps a good mechanism or could be a possible way that this reaction takes place. So there's really a couple of things when you're trying to do that type of mechanism problem, when you're trying to determine, you know, is this kind of a good or bad mechanism? There's really two things you got to make sure of. So the first thing is pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll have a bunch of elementary steps or reactions, so a bunch of little reactions. When you add up all those reactions together and get rid of any intermediates and stuff like that, you do need to end up with the overall reaction you're looking for. So one way to know that the mechanism is not so great is if you add up all the steps and you don't get the reaction you're looking for, it's a bad mechanism, right? So if you add up all the steps and it does come to the same overall reaction that you're looking for, then you're good so far. The second thing that you need to look at then to determine whether or not it's a good mechanism is, is the rate law that was found experimentally. So typically in a lot of mechanism problems, they'll tell you experimentally, the rate law was found to be this. Does the experimental rate law match the rate law for the rate determining step or the slow step of the mechanism. So the slow step in the mechanism should always have the same rate law as the one that was found experimentally. And that's how you know that's a good mechanism. So those are the two things uh, that you need to kind of look at. Does all the reactions add up to the overall reaction? And does the rate law for the slow step or the rate determining step match the one that was found experimentally? Any questions on that there? <clears throat> and again, uh, there's a few variations on uh, some of these problems. But when we talk about sort of a slow step and we talk about, you know, fast step, uh, there are a couple of ways it, it's sort of told to you. Um, first off, uh, you will you could write rate laws for each of the steps of the mechanisms and you can compare it to the one that's found experimentally. And if they match, then you know, that is the slow step. Uh, you can uh, basically find it the next way, which is really hard. And the hard way to find it is uh, right next to each of the elementary steps to write fast and slow. So the one that says slow is the slow step, yes. So that's the other way you could determine the rate determining step, uh, which is a pretty easy one. So when we have this sort of slow step and we have sort of uh, faster steps in a mechanism, you know, what is sort of happening in terms of energy or how can we display that when we think about our energy sort of diagrams? So let me go back over here. I'll steal this page, I think. <clears throat> so if we had our overall reaction of what we were looking at there, the A plus B goes to uh, E plus F. And we have step one here where it's basically A plus B goes to C plus D, and step two, where it is uh, C plus D goes to uh, E plus F, right? And in this case, we will say that, uh, we'll say in my first example here that this is the rate determining step. So this is our slow step in the mechanism, right? So if we were to look at, say, an energy diagram to sort of draw what's happening here, right? our energy right so we would start with our reactants right a plus b and we would have a hill to climb right coming back down to say c plus d right and obviously c and d are intermediates in this case right So 
Am I really a badly drawn one here? But this would be our activation energy, right? For basically step number one, right? So it's got to climb that hill, right? And that's going to determine how fast that first step's going to happen. Now, since the second step here in my example, we we're going to call the fast step. When my C and D get converted into my products, should the activation energy heal for that one be larger than the first one or smaller? Should be smaller, right? Because it's going to go a lot faster. So if we were going to bring this around. You know, we would come back down, maybe something like this. I think I might have made it just slightly smaller, hopefully. Um, and then we have our E plus F in this case, right? So here, just to make it for sure smaller, we'll cut half of it off. Not drawn to scale. All right. So I know that's why I failed art. And it's going to take my whole thing out there. All right. There we go. We'll kind of go this way. We'll come back this way. Come that way. Now I got to fix my arrow. There we go. All right, so if we look at uh, our second heel here, that's the activation energy really for step two, which is our fast step. And we would expect, obviously, you can see there, right, our intermediates would be converted to our products a lot faster than the bigger heel to kind of start the reaction in this case. By the way, overall, this reaction I drew would be exothermic, endothermic. Yeah, it would still be exothermic, right? Because the overall reaction difference right there right, is between those two, uh, which will give us our exothermic reaction. So you can actually, you know, draw energy diagrams if you know a mechanism. And that's sort of what you should show. Uh, obviously, the slow steps should have the larger sort of activation energy heal versus any other steps that you may have. Uh, you may even have like two or three steps. Uh, and again, those should have a smaller sort of heal to climb as those guys go from one step to the next uh, versus the other. Now, obviously, if it was opposite and the second step was uh, the slow step, we would have a bigger hill coming to finish than what we started with uh, coming at the from beginning. Any questions on energy diagrams? Yeah. A rate determining step is the uh, slow step in the mechanism. Yeah. <clears throat> other questions? Okay. So... Uh, I want to say not, not this lab, but the next lab will have you draw some of these sort of energy diagrams uh, for possible mechanism. And again, that's what you want to show is you want to keep about a couple of things in mind as you're drawing these. Obviously, if this reaction was overall endothermic, right, my product should end up above my reactants, right? So you want to think about those. And again, those the hill, uh, the size of the hills for the activation energy between each step um, should reflect the rate determining step versus other ones that are faster. Any questions? Uh, no. All right. So, uh, so let's take a look at uh, this one here. And why don't you try it? Uh, the experimental rate law for this reaction was found to be the rate is equal to K times the NO2 squared. Uh, the reaction is believed to occur in these two steps. Based on this mechanism, what should the overall reaction be? And what is the intermediates? And what can you say about the rates of step one versus step two? So take a couple of minutes and see what you get when you kind of go through that. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so first off, uh, to get the overall reaction, we're just going to basically add these together, right? So uh, in this case here, uh, the NO3. Uh, we also got a little NO2 action. So that should get us uh, an overall equation. Everybody on the left stays on the left. NO2 and CO goes to NO and CO2 in this case. Any questions on that one there? The intermediates in this case are... Intermediate is NO3, yes. Is NO2 an intermediate? It is not an intermediate, although it did reduce down, it is still found overall in the equation. So again, in order for it to be an intermediate, it's got to be completely used up by the time the reaction is done. So that's why NO2, although it did cancel out a little bit, uh, is not an intermediate in this case. All right, so now we could talk about each of these elementary steps. And because this is a reaction mechanism and because uh, these are elementary steps, we can write two rate laws, one for each of these steps. So for example, 
if we were doing the first step here, the rate law would be the rate is equal to K N O two and it would be squared. And that's because basically both of these things together is two N O two and the coefficient there's two. So that's where the square comes from. Basically we wrote the rate law for the uh, bottom step there. The rate would equal K N O three and CO in this case. First off, any questions on how we got those rate laws for each of the steps? Basically, just going to use coefficients as the orders in this case. So again, that's the only place where you should do that. What I know, right, is the rate determining step should be which step? The rate determining step will be step one because when we look at the rate law for step one, it matches perfectly the rate law that was found experimentally. So these two match, which means in this particular mechanism problem, we know that that should be the rate determining step or the slow step in the mechanism. Any questions on that there? So that information helps us answer the last question, which is what can you say about the relative rates of step one versus step two? We know based on the mechanism and the rate law that step one should be the slow step. And obviously step two should be a faster type step, right? That's going to happen, right? Any questions on any of those type of things? So in this particular case, uh, we were again given an experimental rate law. We weren't told, you know, which one is the slow step or the rate determining step. But by writing the rate law for each of these elementary steps, we could find one that matches and we were able to determine that that one was obviously the slow step. This is not necessarily a mechanism problem where they're asking you, is this like a good or bad mechanism? This is just a kind of a different type of mechanism problem uh, than that other question. Any questions on that? <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at another type of mechanism problem like this one here. And this one is a little bit more going on, yeah. So we're going to say that uh, this is our overall reaction. And this is the observed rate law or the experimentally found rate law. And basically what we want to know is, is this kind of a good or bad mechanism, basically? They oftentimes will call it, is it a plausible mechanism? Which means if it is, it's possibly how it could happen. It may not always happen this way. Or if it's not plausible, then it's not a good mechanism. So ultimately what we're looking at is in this type of problem, where you're given a bunch of steps like this, perhaps you're given the overall reaction and uh, the experimentally found rate law. We want to know, is it good or bad? So there's two things that we need to know if it's good or bad. If it's good or bad, we need to make sure that we add up all the steps, right? And we get the overall reaction. And that the rate determining step rate law matches the one that's found experimentally. So those are really the two things that we need to determine uh, if this is a good or bad mechanism. So let's just start with the easiest thing, which is let's just add these guys together. Yeah, so we're going to add these guys together. Once again, we're going to look for things that cancel. So I got this guy here, and this guy is going to cancel. I have uh, this, and this is going to cancel. I feel like that might be it in this case. So uh, at this point here on the left-hand side of the arrow, we have uh, 2NO plus there's an H2 and an H2. So that is 2H2. Uh, goes to the other side. We have one water, two waters. So that is two waters. And we have one of the N2, so that is one N2. So, so far, so good, right? We add up all the steps in this case, and we do end up with the same overall reaction. Any questions on that? That would mean in this case, by the way, our intermediates would be? Yeah, in this case, uh, we do have two different intermediates, uh, the N2O2 and the N2O, as they do not appear in the overall reaction. So. Uh, that would be an intermediate, and so would this guy, right, be an intermediate as well. 
All right. So now that we checked out basically step one there that it's good, uh, we got to verify with step number two that it is also a good mechanism or a bad mechanism. So I can get rid of some of my scribble over our steps here so we can see it. Okay. So first off, right off the bat, when I look at each of these elementary steps, they are labeled fast, slow, fast which means right off the bat, I should know which step is the rate determining step. Step two, it's a slow step. So because this one is labeled slow, that means step number two is our rate determining step. That means that step number two, if this is a good mechanism, should have a rate law that matches the one that they found experimentally, right? So let's write the rate law for step number two. So if we wrote the rate law for step two, the rate would equal K times H2 times N2O2, right? And once again, our intermediates here were N2O2 and N2O, right? Okay. So what I want to do is I want to see, does this rate law match this rate law? Do they match? The answer is you don't really know because what I have in this rate law that I just wrote is I have this guy right here, which is an intermediate, right? So when you compare something, right, the old saying is you want to compare apples to apples, right? Oranges to oranges. So you cannot compare two rate laws where you kind of have an intermediate in one and not in the other. So before we could actually make that decision, which overwhelmingly most of you say that it doesn't match so we're going to see in a second if it does or not uh, we do have to actually get rid of the intermediate in our rate law and to do that we actually have to go back to maybe some of the other steps to do so um, so we're basically going to substitute out the n2o2 using the other steps of the mechanism so that we could end up with a rate law where frankly we have apples to apples we could kind of compare the two now, when we look at step one and step two, what is the only step that has N2O2 in it? Step one. So that is definitely where I should focus. So I'm not going to worry about step three because, frankly, it has nothing in it that I need, right? So at this point, you don't really need to use step three. Now, in some cases, you may need to use multiple steps, but in a lot of cases, you can kind of focus in on one step versus the other. We also see something different in this step versus the other steps, and that is the arrow. Yeah, that is an arrow that is heading in both directions, right? So that is basically heading this way and heading this way with a K1 and a K to the minus one. That is what we call a reversible, right? Reaction. It has a forward direction where it goes from reactants to products. And at some point when you make products, which is the basis of everything we're going to talk about from the next chapter on, those guys will come back the other way and the products will recombine and basically make some reactants. And it will continue to go in both directions, which is the forward direction, reactants to products, and the reverse direction, which is products back to reactants, until equilibrium is reached. Chemical equilibrium means that the rate of the forward reaction will equal the rate of the reverse reaction. It doesn't mean they're equal to each other. It just means as quick as it goes one way, it's going to go back the other way. So because this is a reversible reaction, for step number one, we could actually write not one rate law, but we could actually write two different rate laws, one for the forward direction and one for the reverse direction. So if we were to look at step number one here, and we write our forward direction. That is our reactants going to products. Our rate law would be the rate is equal to K N O and we need to square it, right? Now, if I did it for the reverse direction, if the reaction is heading in the reverse direction, that means our products are really our reactants, right? And our reactants are our products. That means when we write the rate law, we actually will include the products because that's really the reactants going in that direction which will give you this and whoops if i write it right it would be much better probably let's try that again uh, 
All right, so I got uh, N202, basically. So basically going in the reverse direction, our products are reactive, so that is why the products is in there. Any questions on that so far? Now, as I mentioned before, when it reaches equilibrium, the rate of the forward direction will equal the rate of the reverse direction, which means this number right here, which is the rate, and this guy right here, which is the rate, I don't really know what it is, the actual number, but are they the same number or different numbers? They are the same, yeah. And that's very helpful for us because if they're the same, that means I could set the other half of those guys equal to each other. So that means that K of NO squared would equal our K of N2O2 by setting the other halves equal to each other because they basically equal the same number. This is advantage to me because ultimately, what am I trying to do here? Anybody remember? I'm trying to get rid of this, right? Which means I need to solve for this. That means I need to send my K to the other side, right? And divide it. And that will give me K, really it's K1 of NO squared divided by K to the minus one equals my N2O2. So basically what I did is I used step number one to basically solve for my intermediate and give me a relationship based on step number one of the mechanism of what that intermediate really equals. Any questions on that? Now that I have the intermediate and what it equals, I could take this entire thing, right? And stick it into my rate law that I originally wrote. And if I do that, the rate will equal K, H2, and now substituting in what I got going on there, K1, my NO squared, divided by my K to the minus one. Any questions on that there? I now see in my substituted equation a bunch of Ks, right? I got a, a K here, I got a K here, and I got a K here, right? Those are all rate constants, right? Which means, are they the same or different numbers? They are the same, which means we could get rid of two of them, right? So the top guy and the bottom guy will cancel out. And that will now give me a rate law that looks something like this, H2NO squared. Does this match? It does, which means it actually is a good mechanism, even though you were not convinced originally, yes? So this is a good mechanism, right? Or I guess a better way to put that is it is actually a plausible mechanism as to how this reaction may occur. Again, it may not always occur exactly in this order, but uh, it is a possible way to, for it to go. So it's really important in this type of mechanism problem when you're asked, you know, basically, is it a good or bad mechanism? You got to make sure that when you compare those rate laws that you are comparing apples to apples, you don't have any intermediate in your rate law when you're trying to compare it to the one that was found experimentally. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of times in these type of uh, sort of mechanism problems, you will have probably a step that's like a reversible one. You may not always, but usually you will have one that will, because it's really kind of needed to solve for what you're looking for. So a lot of times there'll be at least one step in there that's reversible. Other questions? So these are kind of like what a math proofs, right? Or you got to know the answer, but you got to kind of prove that it is or not, right? So I don't remember any of those things other than they used to make you fold pages over and do one on one side, one on the other. But um, so that's kind of what we're doing. So now that I did one, you do one. Uh, you do this one. All right. Show that this proposed mechanism matches what we found experimentally. The two is way up here, so I'll bring it down. <laughs> the two is there. All right. So this is the experimentally found rate law. This is the overall reaction. This is the proposed mechanism. Yeah, let's take a look, see how you're doing. So remember, in order for this to be a plausible mechanism or sort of a good mechanism, uh, we basically need two things to happen. We need to, when we add up these steps, they do equal the overall reaction. So that's usually a pretty good place just to start with, right? So uh, obviously here, O looks like it will cancel. And I think 
that is about. Um, so we will end up with uh, we'll end up with uh, two o three there, two uh, three o two. So that part is good. Uh, these are obviously the steps, not the part of any coefficients or anything like that. Um, so that part is good. We also know just based on the labeling there that step number two should be our rate determining step, right? As that is the slow step in the mechanism. That also should have a rate law that matches the one that was found experimentally. So if we were to write our rate law for that, the rate would equal K, O, 3, and O in this case. Any questions up to there? Now, as we see from canceling out our equations, O is our intermediate, right? So that is going to create a little problem for comparing these two. So we're going to need to do what we just did in that previous problem. We're going to need to use, in this case, step number one, since it's the only step there, uh, to basically solve for O so that we can substitute it out and compare apples to apples. So once again, when we look at uh, step number one here, it is a reversible reaction, which means uh, for the forward direction, which is going from reactants to products, the rate will equal K times O3. For the reverse direction, uh, which is going from uh, products back to reactants, the rate would equal K times O2 and O. Any questions on where those came from? Once again, when this reaches equilibrium, the rate of the forward direction and the reverse direction will be the same. So that's going to allow you to put the other parts once again equal to each other. So we would have this equal to this. And in this case, we are looking to kind of isolate this guy by itself, which means that we do need to divide uh, both of these guys to the other side, right? And when we do that, that gives us KO3 divided by KO2 equals our O. We now have what we need to substitute in, right? So we now have O here that we can substitute in for the O in our original rate law. And if we put our numbers in, uh, we will get that the rate is equal to KO2. And I'll just put it in directly the way I wrote it, uh, which is K O3 over O2, right? And a K. Once again, our rate constants on top and bottom will really cancel out. And this will then give me, uh, we got there. this will give me my uh, rate is equal to K times, I feel like I put a two where it should have been a was, this is a three there. There you go, right? That should be three. And add that out. That should be three, and that should be two right there. Right? Uh, I feel like I got an O in the wrong spot, huh? Right, we got a, uh, we have K to the O3 and O2. That should be, this first one should be O3, right? Thank you. I'm like, I feel like I have a two in the wrong spot there. Also helps, I guess, to copy it correctly, but from where I wrote it right. All right. So I did have it right here. That's what I was trying to write there. There. O3. Sorry about that. There we go. Now that's going to give us K to the O3 squared divided by O2. And now we have something that we can compare. Do they match? They actually do match, right, because O2 to the minus 1 is 1 over O2, right? So that is the same as this, basically 1 over O2. You don't really need the 1. And now you can see it matches in that case, yeah. So once again, it does match, and uh, that would mean it's a good or plausible mechanism that occurred. Any questions on that? So this is a very common mechanism problem where, you know, you're trying to use the elementary steps to build out and prove that you have matching um, rate laws. And very commonly, you do need to kind of get rid of that intermediate when you're trying to do that. Any questions on this type of rate law? It's a problem. All right. So another mechanism problem is uh, one such as this. 
So let's take a look at this. We want to determine the overall reaction. What is the rate determining step and the rate law here in this case? So if we want the overall reaction, we should just add these guys, right? And that would mean that our B would cancel. And that is it, I think. So 2A plus B to the 2 would give us 2AB would be our overall reaction. We could see from the labeling, right, that the rate determining step in this case is the first step, right? And we know that the intermediate here will be B, right? And we're looking for the rate law. So in this case, what should the rate law equal? The rate law for which step? Should equal the rate law for the slow step. So we can write that in the rate law here should be K A and B two there. So in this case, we aren't given any uh, experimentally found rate law, but knowing that that first one is a slow step, that means that we should have a rate law that matches, that would be the same and consistent with the first step in this mechanism. And we also see in our rate law, right, that we got from the first step, there's no intermediate, right? So again, we don't have to worry about any type of substituting out anything. It should really be that one there. Any questions on mechanism type of problems? So a few different types of mechanism problems that we talked about, but you do need to be able to obviously write the appropriate rate law based on a mechanism, be able to determine what's the rate determining step or the slow step, and obviously determine whether or not, you know, a mechanism is good or bad. Any questions on any of that? And I, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you don't need to know how many values you need to for the rate at the very bottom. So the numerator and the denominator. How did, how did we get to this thing? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, no. yeah so basically, be, when I didn't screw it up by writing the wrong thing, but uh, basically we went back to the original um, rate law that we had for the second step. And the original rate law up through this point, right, is basically this, right? So what was left in that original rate law was the O, which is what we did all the math for to basically figure out what O equals. And that is what O equals right here. And that is what was put into that spot there. And then we just kind of cleaned it up a little bit better after I found my mistake. Are you guys helping me find my mistake there? <laughs> Other questions? <clears throat> okay. All right, so to just finish up this chapter, we talked a little bit about a, a catalyst as we kind of went through the chapter, but a reminder that a catalyst, again, is a substance that uh, is added typically to a reaction to speed it up. And there are negative catalysts, which actually can slow down a reaction. Uh, sometimes we do add things to slow down reactions. Uh, for example, when we talk about nuclear chemistry, um, you know, you could add things to nuclear reactions, fission reactions to kind of slow it down as well. But uh, it's not a reaction, it's not a product. It will still be there when the reaction's over. Again, just facilitating that reaction to sort of occur more efficiently. And as we talked about, we see as a result of that, that sort of decrease in the activation energy hill that the reactants have to climb. And again, that usually will translate uh, into a uh, faster rate. So as the activation energy goes down, we see a faster rate or a faster, higher rate constant happening, which means again, we see it occurring a lot faster. Now, as we talked a little bit about, and we're not gonna go into too much detail here, but uh, there are different types of catalysts and there's heterogeneous catalysts, which again, like a heterogeneous mixture means things are in different phases you can see. So the catalyst and what's reacting are in different phases. So like the Haber process of ammonia, ammonia really is a spontaneous reaction, but it's like a super slow reaction if you don't put a catalyst in it. And there's lots of reactions as we talked about, and as we will continue to talk about in this semester, that again, when we think about it being spontaneous, it doesn't have anything really to do with how fast or slow it takes place. Again, it's the kinetics that we talked about in this chapter that deals with how fast or slow a reaction takes place. But just because a reaction is spontaneous, it could take forever really in a day for that reaction to kind of take place, or you could have a fast spontaneous reaction. Um, the production of nitric acid, catalytic converters, uh, those are also uh, heterogeneous catalysts. Um, homogeneous catalyst means that the reactants and the catalysts are really in the same phase. 
So a lot of times, for example, the experiment we're doing today or, did, or continuing to do, uh, really the HCL is a catalyst, although we're treating it more like a reactant, but in that reaction, it's really a catalyst. And that's in the same phase as everything else is reacting, right? It's all basically aqueous solutions uh, floating around as ions and um, it sort of helps the reaction occur, yeah. Uh, well, it, I can't really tell you exactly because uh, I will kind of give you the answer of what you're trying to find for ACL, but you'll be able to kind of determine that based on sort of what we talked about um, with orders, right? So you'll be able to figure out the actual order of HCL. And let's just say hypothetically, the order you got was like four, shouldn't probably be maybe, but uh, say you got four for HCL, right? Then it would play a really big role in how fast it's happening, right? But say you got zero for HCL, as we talked about, right? Then it really wouldn't play that much of a role. So you could actually kind of be able to sort of determine, you know, in the sense of that one, you know, how fast or slow that reaction would take place. Other questions? Yeah. Try to do that without giving you the, the answer that you're going to get as a result of the experiment there. Uh, so here's an example of the Haber process of ammonia, which is obviously our N2 and our H2, right, making ammonia. Our gas molecules basically flying around. And a little balancing like I'm in chemistry class, right, or something like that, maybe, or maybe a three would be better. And uh, in this particular case here, uh, these guys just flying around by themselves will take a long time for them to sort of find each other. But by using some type of metal catalyst like we see here, it really does sort of direct everybody to a central location, allows them to interact really well for each other. And in this case also helps a little bit with the breaking and making of the bond formation a lot more efficient. Uh, here's nitric acid, again, platinum used as a catalyst here. Um, and again, this is a solid catalyst. That's your car catalytic converter if it has one. Again, uh, they have catalysts in there, right? Which is why people steal them, right? They're precious metals. Uh, there was an email that's like, if you see somebody walking in the parking lot with a reciprocating saw, you might want to call somebody <laughs> and check it, check to make sure you still have your catalytic converter on your car. Um, but uh, you know, obviously it goes through and helps with obviously emissions. There's, they have two of them, one for carbon and, and other emissions uh, coming through. All right. So that actually is uh, chapter 12. Any questions on any of that there?